Hello! Welcome to another chapter of the Lost Years of Merlin series. We are on book three, chapter six, called The Fires of Merlin. And some exciting news is we got the physical copy of the book today. So we don't have to use the little ebook anymore, and I can actually hold a little book and like, read it. <laughs> so, anyway, here is. Oh, in the last chapter, chapter five, um, Merlin woke up and the Creelix was dead. And we, because Rhea used her, um, her tree speak to um, tell the tree to attack it. Um, because you've got to, like, be sneaky. And remember, the Creelix is the thing that feeds on magical powers. And, and yeah, it's real spooky stuff. So, anyway... This is chapter six, called Two Halves of Time. Unable to sleep, I rolled from one side to the other on the bed of pine needles. I tried crooking an arm beneath my head, bunching the tunic under my knees, or staring at the thick web of branches above me. I tried thinking about the evening mist, filtering through stands of trees at sunset, or the starlit sea, sparkling with thousands of eyes upon the waters. Nothing helped. Again, I rolled over. Eh. A spiky pine cone jabbed the back of my neck. I brushed it aside, nestled my shoulder deeper, deeper into the needles, and tried once again to relax. To rest at least a little. To move beyond the doubts, the wanderings, so vague I couldn't even put them into words, that poked at me like a pine cone of the mind. I drew a deep breath. The fragrance of pine, sweet and tangy, flowed over me like an invisible blanket. Yet this blanket lacked enough warmth to ward off the chill night air. I shivered, knowing that before long the first snow would fall in this forest. Another deep breath. Normally the smell of pine calmed me right away. Perhaps it reminded me of the quieter days of my childhood, long before the pieces of my life began to shift like river pebbles under my feet. In those days I often climbed up to my mother's table of healing herbs. Sometimes I simply watched her shifting and straining, while the wondrous aromas filled my lungs. Other times, though, I mixed my own combinations, meshing whatever colors and textures pleased me. All the while, the smells, thyme, beech root, sea kelp, peppermint, so strong that one whiff popped, up, popped open my eyes and tingled my scalp. Lavender, mustard seed, straight from the meadow, dill, which always made me sneeze, and, of course, pine. I loved to crush the needles so that my fingers would smell like a pine bough for hours. So why tonight did they do so little to me? They only pierced my shoulders, my back, and my legs like so many little daggers. Curling myself into a ball, I tried again to relax. Something nudged the middle of my back. Rhea's foot, no doubt. Maybe she, too, was having trouble sleeping. The nudge came again. Rhea, I grumbled not bothering to roll over. Is it not enough you insisted on following me? I paused, correcting myself before she could. Guiding me, I mean, when it made things so much worse for our mother. You don't have to come over here and kick me as well. Again, this time harder. All right, all right, I admitted. I know you promised her you'd turn back at Arnaldo's lands. And yes, I did agree to that idea. But I agreed because you could save me half a day or more. Not because you'd keep me up all night. When I felt another nudge, I flipped over and angrily grabbed a hedgehog. Hardly bigger than my fist, it curled itself even tighter, burying its face in a mass of bristles. Embarrassed, I grinned. Poor little creature. It was clearly frightened. Probably cold, too. I hefted the prickly ball. Though I couldn't see its face, I recognized the darker markings of a male. No more than a few months old, most likely. The little fellow could have been lost, separated from his family or simply cold enough that he had abandoned any caution for the warmth of my back. Holding him in my palm, I started gently stroking along his spine. While I had learned much in the last year about the language of trees, having moved well beyond the simple swishing of beeches, I could now carry on a rudimentary chat with an elm or even an oak. I still knew practically nothing about the speech of animals. Even so, I managed to produce a piping yikalik, yikalik which I had once heard a mother hedgehog sing to her brood. Very slowly, while I continued stroking, the ball began to uncurl. 
First came the leathery pads of the rear feet, each no bigger than my thumbnail. Then came the front feet, then the belly, swelling like a dark bubble in a peat bog. At last an eye emerged, then the other, blacker than the shadows of night surrounding us. Finally came the nose, snipping the skin of my thumb. As I stroked more vigorously, he released a tiny, throaty sigh. Rhea would enjoy this little creature, even if it meant waking her and admitting my own folly. I could already hear her bell-like laugh when I told her that I had mistaken him for her foot. Sitting upright on the bed of needles, I turned my second sight toward the cluster of fern where she had fallen asleep. Suddenly, my heart froze. She was gone. Setting down the hedgehog, I ignored this plaintive wh his plaintive whispers, whimpers as I clambered to my feet. My second sight stretched to its fullest, peering through the shadowy branches and dark trunks of the grove. Where had she gone? Having trekked with her so often, I was accustomed to her daytime roamings, whether to forage for food, follow a deer's tracks, or plunge into the cool water of a tarn. But she had never before left camp at night. Had something sparked her curiosity? Or brought her harm? I cupped my hands around my mouth. Rhea! No reply. Rhea! Nothing. The forest seemed unusually quiet. No branches clacked or groaned. No wings fluttered. Only the continuing whimpers of the hedgehog broke the silence. Then, from somewhere beyond the ferns, came a familiar voice. Do you need to be so loud? You'll wake every living thing in the forest. Rhea! I grabbed my staff, sword, and leather satchel. Where in dog does name are you? Out here, of course. Where else did you expect me to watch the stars? Buckling the belt of my sword, I hurried through the mass of ferns. As often as I ducked to avoid the pine boughs, a jagged limb would clutch at my tunic. All of a sudden, the trees parted. A chill breeze splashed my face. I stood at the edge of a small, rock-strewn meadow. To my left, a spring bubbled out of the ground, forming a pool enclosed by reeds. Beside it rested a flat slab of moss-rimmed stone. There, her arms wrapped around her shins and her face turned skyward, sat Rhea. As I approached, whatever frustration I harbored melted away. She seemed so at peace, so at home. How could I blame her? I leaned my staff against the stone, sat down beside her, and gazed. Stars, an immense swath of them, arched above us. Like singers in a grand celestial chorus, they marched across the sky, linking through outstretched arms of light. It reminded me of the phrase, carved into the wall of the great tree that was Rhea's home, as well as my own memory, the great and glorious song of the stars. Rhea continued, to scan, Rhea continued scanning the sky, her curls sparkling with starlight. So you couldn't sleep? Neither could I. You found a better way to spend the night than I did, though. I was just tossing around on pine needles. Look there, she cried, pointing to a plummeting star. Brightly it burned for an instant, then swiftly vanished. I've often wondered, she said wistfully, whether a star like that one falls somewhere on our world or in someone else's. Or into a river beyond, I offered. A great round river that carries the light of all the stars, flowing endlessly into itself. Yes, she whispered. And maybe that river is also the seam binding the two halves of time. You remember that story? One half always beginning, the other always ending. Propping my elbows on the stone, I leaned farther back. How could I forget? You told it to me on the same night you showed me how to find constellations, not just in the stars themselves, but in the spaces between them. And you told me about that horse. What was his name? Pegasus. Pegasus! A winged steed, prancing from star to star with you hugging its back. She laughed, a bell pealing in the forest. How I'd love to fly like that myself. I grinned. It reminds me of the thrill, the freedom, of my first time on horseback. Really? For the first time since my arrival, she turned from the glittering vista. When did you ever ride horseback? Long ago. So long ago. It was a great black stallion belonging to our father. I didn't say the rest before Rita Gower corrupted him, filling him with the wicked spirit's lust to control Finkyra. Those words still left such a hateful taste in my mouth. I don't remember much about that horse, except that I loved to ride him, with someone holding me, of course. I was so small. But I loved the sound of his hooves beneath me, pounding, pounding, 
and the warm breath from his nostrils. Every time I visited him at the castle stable, I brought him an apple, just so I could feel his warm breath on my hand. Softly, she touched my shoulder. You really loved that horse. I sighed. It's all so blurry now. Maybe I was just too young. I can't even remember his name. Maybe it'll come back to you in a dream. That happens sometimes. Dreams can bring back the past. My teeth clenched as I thought about the only dream that brought back the past for me over and over and over again. How I hated that dream. It stuck at unpredictable time. It struck at unpredictable times, but always carried me to the same place beyond the swirling mists surrounding Finkyra, across the sea, to a ragged village in the land called Gwynedd. There, a powerful boy, Denadius by name, attacked me. In my rage, I called upon my hidden powers and caused a fire, a fire that exploded out of the very air. The blaze! It scorched my face, searing the skin of my cheeks and brow. I lost my own eyes in those flames, while Denadius, I fear, lost his life. The dream always ended in the same way. Denidius, shrieking in mortal agony, his arms crushed beneath the blazing branches of a tree. I always awoke the same way as well, sobbing, clutching at my sightless eyes, feeling the pain of those flames. And what made the dream worse was that it was true. Even as I shuddered, Rhea twirled one of her fingers around my own. I'm sorry, Merlin. I didn't mean to upset you. Were you thinking about the dragon? No, no, just dragons of my own. She released my finger and ran her hand across the stone's rough surface, the worst kind. I swallowed, the very worst. Sometimes those dragons are different from what they seem. What do you mean? She faced me squarely. The Galator. You know it could help you defeat Valdirg. Why, it could be your only chance. So why aren't you going after it first, before you have to face him? My cheeks grew hot. Because there's no time. Why, you heard... Is that all? She interrupted. Your only reason? Of course it is. Really? Of course! I pounded the stone with my fist. You don't think I'm doing this because I'm scared of... Yes? She asked gently. Of Domnu. I stared at her, amazed. How could she have known? Just the thought of that treacherous old hag made me shudder. Kirpri was right. You really do, do know how to see under someone else's skin. Maybe. She replied. Sometimes it's easier to see someone else's dragons than your own, that's all. As to this one, I don't know whether you should go right to Arnalda's lands or not. Time is short, as you said, but I do know that you're scared of Domnu, very scared, and you need to know it's affecting your thinking, and, more than likely, your sleeping. I couldn't help but grin. You're a lot of trouble, you know, but every once in a while, you're almost worth it. Thanks, she said, returning the grin. My brow furrowed. I think, though, I should still go straight to Arnalda. That was my promise to her, and she needs the help now. Remember her words? My people be attacked this very day, as never before. If you do manage to help her somehow, she doesn't seem the kind of person who's going to give you any thanks. Oh, she would, in her own way. She's crusty, all right, and easily angered. But you can trust her, at least. Not like Dom knew. All Arnalda really wants is to keep her people safe. I reflected for a moment. Even if I could regain the Galator, I couldn't possibly do it in time to help her. On top of that, I never did find out how it works. So even if I found some way to get it back from Domnu, how much better off would I be? I glanced at the sea of stars above us. There's also this. Maybe Arnalda knows something about the dragon that could help. In the same way the Galator helped win the last battle. She is, after all, an enchantress. My gaze met Rhea's. And, finally, there's one more thing. I took a long, slow breath. I'm scared of Domnu, just as much as I am of that dragon. Sparks danced on her head as she nodded sympathetically. Her name, what does it mean? Dark fate. That's all anyone needs to know about her. She calls on magic so ancient that even the most powerful spirits... Rita Gower or dog to himself, just leave her alone. And as much as I'd like to see her humbled, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Just then, my staff slid off the stone. I reached down among the grass to fetch it. Then something pricked the back of my hand. I jumped, startling Rhea so much that both of us nearly tumbled off. At that instant, I started to laugh. 
I lowered my hand into the grass and picked up the little hedgehog, stroking his bristly back. Okay, my friends, thank you for joining me for that little chapter of Rhea and Merlin just talking. I hope you join me tomorrow for chapter seven called The Stone Circle. Have a wonderful night.